First John chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Uh, Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has ever seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, and he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning since the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Lord, as we continue on through the letter of 1 John, Lord, may we hear the intent of John as he wrote this letter under the inspiration of your spirit. May we receive these words as being spiritual truth for our spiritual lives. And Lord, may we grow closer to you, closer to one another, and Lord, closer to our calling to serve you and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You know, this is, this is the point where 1 John could get complicated. This is the point. And, and I knew it was coming because I read ahead. And it might pose a difficult challenge for us. And how we interpret the word really is helpful uh, in situations like this. Because if we disregard good rules of interpretation, like interpreting scripture with scripture, that's a good rule. Or we disregard the larger context of a doctrine, let's say the doctrine of sin, we could make a very simplistic and isolated rendering of this text that might leave us in in a quandary. We could easily conclude after reading this verse that if we sin, we're not children of God, but rather we're children of the devil. And we're like, well, wait a minute. I don't want to be a child of the devil. I want to be a child of God. But sometimes, I don't know if this is your experience. This is mine. And so I'm in the confessional booth right now. Sometimes, when our guard is down, things happen. We, we open our mouths and we say what we're thinking. Has that ever happened to you? And it ended up being sin. Or we look the wrong way. Or we engage our minds in an unhealthy manner or we pass up an opportunity to do what we know is right. We just pass it up. Or we make a judgment towards someone that is based on our opinions and not necessarily based on the teaching of the scripture. Or we get our feelings hurt and then we start to think untrue thoughts about the one who hurt our feelings. Or we get so impressed with how good we're doing that we become prideful or we just flat out hate somebody. And we didn't intend to, but we let our guard down and sin happened. And if we're honest, we would probably all confess that we have sinned, maybe some of you today. And when it comes to this issue, we need to understand it biblically. We need to recognize that sin is just not a despicable, evil deed. You know, if you go out in the world and you say, are you a sinner? And they'll say, no, I've never done any of those most vile, wicked, evil things. I've never raped anybody. I've never murdered anybody. And and the other evil one, I've never misgendered anybody. I've never done any of those evil things. But we need to recognize sin isn't just a despicable, evil deed. Sin is not only the lust we have in our hearts or 
the white lie that we tell or the prejudice that we harbor or maybe the hatred that we allow to come out from within us. Sin is, according to the Bible, anything that falls short of perfection. Whoa, that kind of raises the bar. The best way to define sin in the life of a person. Here's the best definition. This person is doing everything right. You admire this person. They are the most devoted spiritual person you know. They are walking in righteousness. They are walking in obedience, super devoted, making the right kinds of sacrifices. Every thought is captive to the Lord. But then one day, something really small happened, and they slipped, and they fell short of perfection. And that falling short of perfection is probably the purest, best definition of sin. It's like, wait a minute, Chad, that person, there's no better person than that person. How could you say that one little slip up is the best definition of sin? Well, because that's how the word is defined in the Bible. Hamartia means missing the mark. It was a term that they would use in archery competitions. If you did not hit the bullseye, you missed the mark. Oh, that's a good shot. You're really good with that man, bow and arrow. You're like Robin Hood. But you are about two millimeters off from center bullseye. Sinner, you missed the mark. How could you call me? How could you say that was a sin? That was a really, no one else has shot the arrow as good as me. Well, sorry, it's not perfect. It's sin. And we don't often think of sin this way. We don't like to think of it this way because we want to think of sin as a bad deed that we can stop ourselves from doing. Oh, I was tempted to do this. I was tempted to act out in my flesh, but I held myself back. Sin is that bad thing I stopped myself from doing. Or in our will or in our strength, we can deny the real wicked things. Oh, I haven't done any of those wicked things. We like to, because we don't like to think of sin that way because we like to be in control. And we like to know that we're able to to do something of our own volition. And then once we do that, we like to prove that, that we can overcome deeds of sin. So what's the matter with other people? We don't realize that we just, you know, committed the sin of pride. But when we see sin as an attempt to hit the bullseye, an attempt to achieve perfection, and and we have to hit that perfect bullseye every single time, well, suddenly we aren't as righteous in our deeds as we thought we were. It kind of brings us all down to the same level playing field between us and the Lord, all equally in need of the same grace and the same forgiveness that Jesus offers. Now, I'm not in any way dismissing our call to forsake deeds of disobedience. You should forsake deeds of disobedience. We should strive to bring our flesh into submission. We should take every thought into captivity. But we should also realize that no matter how good we are at the deeds of righteousness, we are still in desperate need of the grace of God because perfection is something that we just will not continue in. We will fall short of perfection in this flesh. It will happen. I'm confident it will happen. God's standard of perfection is just too high. If we could achieve it and truly live sinless, then we would have no need for Jesus. So this makes our first impression of today's passage even more difficult. But if I look at the whole of Scripture, I learn a few other things about sin. I learn that I am not condemned unto damnation anew by every sin I commit. If I tell a, a, a small lie for the sake of convenience, I shouldn't have done it, but I did it. It was just a little white lie. I threw it out there. It made everything easier. I don't have to get saved all over again. Some people do believe that. Oh, you've committed a sin. Now you're no longer saved and you need to get saved all over again. And so it's like, hey, what's your testimony? Oh, my testimony of my salvation. Well, I got saved 47 times this week. We don't have to do that. I'm already forgiven of of that sin and I need to continue in a practice of repentance because this forgiveness is continually available to me. I do not take it for granted. 
I take his forgiveness as a challenge for me to walk in obedience. And I know that if I say I do not have sin, I'm a liar. The Bible says that. I recognize that I'm broken and severely imperfect. And in my own strength, in my own effort, I cannot achieve holiness on my own. I desperately need the holiness that is given to me freely to be given by the grace of Jesus. That's, that's what I need. So when I look at this passage, my initial response might be confusion and despair. If I fall short of perfection, in my every effort to be righteous, does that mean I'm actually a son of the devil? Because when I interpret scripture with scripture, this isn't the message I'm finding. So my initial understanding of this passage might be off. Oftentimes, we have to look deeper We have to consider the context of the overall message and the specific application of words and phrases. And when we do, especially in today's passage, we find out with much relief that we are not children of the devil. In fact, the opening verse tells us we are children of God. Why? Well, because this isn't a passage about sin. This passage isn't about sin. But wait a minute, Pastor Chad, I read it. There's a whole bunch of verses here about sin. I know, I know, but this isn't a passage about sin. This is a passage about God's love. And specifically, the outcome of God's love in our life. Because of his love, we have promises that give us a hope that purifies. And as one who is purified by this hope, we will not practice sinning or practice lawlessness. We won't keep on sinning. Instead, because of his love, we will practice righteousness. Now, I've heard this passage preached so many times, and most of the time, it just focuses heavily on sin. What a great opportunity for me, the self-righteous preacher, to proclaim how good I am and bad you are and guilt all you people manipulate you. But I'm not going to do that. But that's, I've heard it that way before. But this isn't the focus of John's message. His focus is on God's love for us, a love that we should recognize and a love that should change us significantly. Let's look at these opening verses again. See what kind of love the Father has given to us. So he's drawing our attention. Hey, wake up, look, see. See what? The kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. There's your affirmation. So we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. So the passage starts with privilege. We see this pattern all over the Bible. I love this about the Bible because oftentimes we see the Bible calling us to make a hard decision or or calling us to take a big step of faith or or calling us to, to an act of obedience that we might think is difficult. But it starts out by telling us how privileged we are. It starts out with grace. It starts out with what God has poured into our lives. Therefore, we respond to that by doing these things. What is our privilege here? God's love is ours. It's for us. And we see what kind of love it is. It's pretty impressive. Now, here's something we also learn about God's love in the Bible. God's love is real and available for all humanity. All humanity. God's love is real and available for all humanity. Unless you believe in limited atonement, just zone out for a while. Maybe someday, you know, you can repent. And But for those who believe in and receive his love, not only is it available, but it's transformative. So God loves everybody, but only some people experience that love. And those who do experience, well, for them, it's transformative. Now, please take note of this little caveat concerning God's love. Because you know people out there, you you see them, you hear them say things, they come on the TV, and you just shake your head in disgust. You're like, what an awful, what an awful human being. Ah, here's these people saying things I don't agree with. Ah, Terrible. Or these people are mind slaves to popular thought. Look, they're just parroting what the world says, mind slaves. 
Or people who think that Christians are brainless morons. They're out there criticizing us. Oh, I can't believe those things those atheists are saying about us. Or those people who vote on the opposite aisle of you. What's the matter with those people? All of those people, not only do they bear the image of God because they were, as humans, created in God's image, but listen, they're also loved by God. Wait a minute, I don't like them. How can God love them? Well, we could say the same thing for you. Look at this passage. God shows his love for us that we, while, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ didn't say, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and give myself as a sacrifice. It's going to be awful. It's going to be painful, but I'm going to go obediently. I'm going to do it. I'm going to take upon me the sins of the world. But first, I need you to be obedient. First, I need you to walk in obedience. If so, he'd still be sitting there in the Garden of Gethsemane waiting. He's like, I'm still waiting. You see, that ultimate sacrificial expression of love is still available to everyone out there who is still a sinner. And by sinner, I don't mean Christians who slip up now and then. I'm talking about people who are unsaved and they're committing their lives to a practice of sin. God's love for them is expressed in the fact that Jesus died for them. So God has a real and available love for all humanity, and this is an incredible display of love. And as long as people reject it, they fail to experience it. But for those of us who have received his forgiveness, he offers, for those of us who have pledged our faith and our obedience to them, he's offered us something that's more than just a display. For us, it's an experience that is meant to change us. And here's something that John wrote in another part of the Bible. Back in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Later in John 3, John, Jesus confounds Nicodemus. He confounds him with talk of being born again. And Nicodemus is like, I've already been born. Here I am. You know, how am I going to do that again? Let me say something completely ridiculous about climbing back into my mother's womb. That's how ridiculous. No, that'll never happen. How can that happen? You confounded. But you know, we were born once in the flesh, but our spirits, though present and real and to some extent aware, are not truly alive until God makes it so. Our part of this work is experienced Only in faith and surrender. We don't become children of God by anything that we can do of our own wills. How do I become a Christian? How do I do it? Well, you just, I got a list. I got a book for you to follow. You know, step one, you got to do this. You got to attend these services. You got to take this class. You know, you got to do the test. You got to to take communion. You got to take notes. You got to show up at this many meetings a week. You got to go to confession. I mean, if you really want to be saved, you, you do all these things. Oh, don't forget getting baptized. Do all these things, and, and you'll be saved. Th- listen, there's no religious checklist of duties and obligations. Because salvation cannot happen simply by engaging our wills to do the work. Now, it, it can only happen by surrendering our wills. The second half of verse 1 highlights an interesting fact concerning this great privilege. We are born spiritually by the will of God. We have entered into his family and we are now his children. Where then does that put us in reference to the world around us? Look at the second half of the verse. Look at it there. The reason why the world does not know us is because it did not know him. And listen, there's no magic Greek definition of the word know here. It simply means to understand or to grasp or to ascertain. People who do not genuinely know Jesus do not and cannot understand or truly grasp people who do know Jesus. They don't get you. They don't. They they don't get you. They know your personality. They know stuff about you. They have relationships with you, friendships with you. They're related to you. But there's something about you that they're like, yeah, but they're a Christian. They're kind of weird. You know, I don't, what a waste of energy. 
They like give money away to the church. What a, that's crazy. They serve. They're gone on Sunday mornings all the time. I mean, these Christians are weird. What, what, what is it? What, what is it about them? They don't understand our faith. Here's, here's something it said in John chapter 1. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And that word overcome also means comprehend. The darkness does not comprehend it. The darkness does not understand it. So in Jesus there is life. We learned that in John 1. And that life is the light to men. And we who are believers, we walk in that light. And that light is in us. And the darkness cannot comprehend it. In Colossians 3 verse 1, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Verse 2, set your mind on things that are above, not on things of the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ. You see, the world might know us in context to the things that are of this earth. But as they don't know Christ, they don't fully understand those who are hidden in Christ. You, Christian, are to set your mind on things above. They don't even know what that means. Friends and family, they might continue to put up with us. I'm happy that I have friends and family that put up with me. Even though, you know, my brother said I'm in a cult. And if I'm in a cult, that means I must be a cult leader. Just don't feel like I'm that charismatic of a person. (laughs) But we still have a great relationship. We, We have a good friendship, even though I'm apparently a cult leader. Some might not know what to do with the fact that they don't understand you, and they're going to process that differently. And so they're going to hate us. They're going to discriminate against us. They're going to judge us because... That part that they don't understand, they don't know what to do with, and when people don't understand something, one of the base reactions is hate, discriminate, put down. Jesus recognized that this would happen. Again, the book of John, verse 15, or chapter 15, 18 and 19. If the world hates you, know that it hates me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So the privilege of being in God's family is still by greater, is still far greater in contrast to any of the hate that the world might bring to you. Hey, I'm not going to become a Christian because it says in the Bible the world will hate me. I don't want the world hating me. Listen, the benefits by far outweigh any hate that the world might throw at you. The privilege comes with a promise that when Christ appears, we will be like him. And that's a pretty good promise. Do you guys think that's a pretty good promise? It is. So verse 1 and 2 are about God's love. They lay for us a foundation of great privilege. Because of his love, we are now in his family, and we will one day be transformed. But with privilege comes responsibility. You've heard that before, right? Everyone knows that concept. With privilege comes responsibility. And so before we move into verse 3, let's consider something. It's familiar to us because we just finished 2 Peter. But here's a great example of privilege leading to responsibility. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 4 through 6, by which he has granted us his precious and very great promises that through them we may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in this world because of sinful desire. Look at that, verse 4. Christian, this is your privilege. This is yours. You, You have been granted precious and great promises. Because of that, you can partake in the divine nature. You have escaped corruption. Those are great privileges. Verse 5, for this reason... Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Okay, 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 all right, all right. Great privileges. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I have faith and believe in you. Now I'm going to try to be virtuous. All right, is that enough? No, with virtue, knowledge. Oh, okay, I guess I'll keep on learning. And knowledge with self-control. Oh, that's the hard part. All right, I'll work on self-control. 
and self-control with steadfastness. You mean I just got to keep on keeping on? Yeah. And with steadfastness, godliness. Oh, okay. And, and godliness with brotherly affection. Oh, man. There's that loving your brother thing again. Anything but that. And brotherly affection with love. And if these qualities are yours and are increasing, you mean I have to keep increasing them? Can't I just like check them off and do them all once? No, no, increasing. Keep on doing them. Why? Because they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus. Do you feel like you've grown ineffective or unfruitful in your knowledge of Jesus? <laughs> You're not recognizing your privilege and responding accordingly. Peter echoes this message. We are partakers of the divine nature. We have escaped corruption. Therefore, since we have such a great privilege, we need to respond with great responsibility. And he gives us a list in verses 5 through 8, calling us to walk right, to grow, to learn, to apply what we've learned, to love, and to do all of this in an ever-increasing manner so that we will be effective and fruitful. In 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1, it says, since we have these promises, promises are good. Promises are privilege. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us, here's how we respond. Here's how we respond to the privilege in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. So this is a repeating theme we have promises, again, more privileges, therefore we respond obediently and we respond with responsibility. Now look at 1 John 3, verse 3. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Whoever hopes, or whenever hope, whenever hope comes up, and it comes up a lot, whenever hope comes up, I instinctively go to like my favorite passage in the whole Bible. You know, what's your life verse? I don't have a life verse, but I have a favorite passage. And, and that's Romans 5. You should all know this one well. I quote it often. Because I think it's one of the most useful everyday utility texts in the Bible. And if you go to Romans chapter 5, I believe it's verse 2, he starts out, he says, we hope in the glory of God. And you have to highlight that part and underline it because the next line will make you forget it. It starts out by saying, we hope in the glory of God, but we often forget that little part because then he goes on to say, we hope also in suffering. Now all we're thinking about is suffering. We've already forgotten the first part. It's like, oh, suffering. I don't want to suffer. But once he mentions that, we forget about the hope part. But the suffering part starts a progression of thought that ends again with hope. So I, I want to read, read it Read the part that follows us hoping in the glory of God. We hope also in suffering. And it tells us that suffering produces endurance. Okay? Oh, I have to endure suffering? How come I just can't claim myself a victim and say, oh, I'm suffering. You know, oh, the world did this to me. Woe is me. I'm a victim. Injustice has been done to me. Well, you're not going to get anywhere with that. Nothing. You're not going to get anywhere with that. But if you suffer, you say, you know what? The world is throwing some suffering at me. That's what the world does. Jesus actually promised it. In this world, you'll have tribulation. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to learn to endure. And then Romans 5, verse 4 says, and endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Why do so many people lack character? They lack the ability to endure and press on. They lack the ability to hear something that might be offended and they don't get offended. Why do so many people lack character? Because they're unwilling to endure just the common suffering that the world throws at us. This passage is a hope sandwich. Do you notice that? Starts with hope, ends with hope. And it's teaching us that if we have matured and we have developed character, then we're capable of a hope that is not self-centered. That's the message of Romans 5. Do you want a hope that does not disappoint you? Stop hoping in yourself. 
Self-centered hope will disappoint you. Self-centered hope will put you to shame. You know, Lord, I hope that I would win the lottery. And your Bible says that hope will not disappoint. Hope will not put me to shame. Well, that kind of hope will disappoint. And that kind of hope will put you to shame. That's not the kind of hope he's talking about. Self-centered hope will disappoint. But God wants us to mature to a place where our hope is in him. Well, how did the passage begin? We hope also, we hope in the glory of God. How do we become a person who hopes in the glory of God? Because God will be glorified. Doesn't matter what happens in our world, God will be glorified. We want to hope in that. Not hope in him doing things for us, but hope in him being glorified. God wants us to hope in his glory. Hey, what's going on in my life? What's going on in the world? What situations am I in? What circumstances am I facing? My hope in all of this is that God would be glorified. That's my hope. Why? Because this life isn't about me. When we say Lord, we do not actually mean me, myself, and I. We mean Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Verse 2 of today's passage is a reminder that he's coming again. That will be an ultimate display of his glory. If our hope remains in that place, verse 3 says, this hope will purify us as he is pure. And the, the beauty is, listen, we are pure. Well, I don't feel pure. Well, you are. We are positionally pure under the blood of Jesus. He wants us to be practically pure also. That is, in the practice of our daily lives. John has been talking a lot about abiding. If you were here last week, it was just like one after another. Abide, 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 abide. Enough already. Like every other word was abide. But it goes hand in hand with hoping If we are mentally anticipating his glory to be revealed, if we are continually practicing works of remaining with him, then there won't be any room for impurity or lawlessness. Continuing on, verse 4, everyone who makes a practice, and this this is is an important word, a practice of sinning, also practices lawlessness, sin is lawlessness, You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. How does the Bible define sin? There's several definitions. Whatever is not of faith is sin. It misses the mark of perfection. Romans 14, verse 23 The thought of foolishness is sin. Proverbs 24, verse 9. If you know to do good and don't do it, it is sin. James 4, verse 17. All unrighteousness is sin. 1 John 5, 17. Falling short of the glory of God is sin. Romans 3, 23. But here in 1 John 3, sin is described as lawlessness. Generally, sin is often spoken of as defilement. It was even earlier on in this letter, but now it's more of an issue of defiance because that's what lawlessness is. It, is. it is defiance. I know what is right. I know what is the law. I know what is true, and I am defying that on purpose. And we're not talking about occasional deeds of sin. We're not talking about transgressions. We're not talking about the many times we fell short of perfection. We're talking about the practice of, of sin, the defiance of sin of law, of truth. One might reflect the weakness of the flesh, but lawlessness and defiance practice, it reflects a dark and rebellious heart. I became a Christian when I was 14. And man, I was, I was committed. I walked the walk. I had the living Bible. Remember that from the 70s? It had pictures of hippies on the front. It was this thick, hardback, it was, uh, it was called The Way, and it had a lot more words in it than it needed to, but, but that's what I had, and I read that thing every day. I was 14, I was 15, I walked with conviction, you know, went on church trips, went on mission trips. However, when I turned 17, I was in a bad place that summer, the summer of 87, 
I was exposed to bad things, bad influences, and for about four to five months, I just did what I wasn't supposed to do. Flat out did what I wasn't supposed to do. And the whole time, the whole time I wanted out. Lord, I don't want to be doing this. Lord, I don't want, I continued to feel conviction. I continued to know it was wrong. I never made an excuse. I never created a narrative for myself to say this is okay to do. And I prayed that God would make it right. You know, have you ever just prayed the prayer, Lord, I need you to grab me by the shoulders and to give me a good shake. Just, you ever prayed that prayer? It's like, Lord, that's really what I need right now. And I was praying that prayer. And I kind of got arrested, and it worked, and I was so relieved. Man, it was just like this weight was off of me. I was so relieved. And when I look at that experience in light of today's passage, I I admit that I don't consider that time of my life, I don't consider that lawlessness, and I don't consider that defiance, and I don't even consider that the practice of sinning. That's just my opinion. Why? Because I cared the whole time. I did not want to be dishonoring God. I knew conviction the whole time. I was miserable. I was not in defiance. However, if I had lived that time without conviction and I just continued on as if it didn't really matter and I continued to party, I continued to think that God doesn't care about this stuff, I continued to kind of build narratives to excuse myself to do this, and if my heart attitude was different, then I would say, oh, that was lawlessness. That was defiance. That was a practice of sinning. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's my perspective. We all have temptations and weaknesses that we might occasionally fall into, but if you fall and remain, and you grow comfortable in those things, and you make excuses for yourself, you have to create an idea that that makes you think it's okay, and you don't have a real sense of conviction about them, if you're doing drugs or if you're having sex outside of the bonds of marriage or if you're stealing from your employer or if you're just content with an ongoing practice of drunkenness or addiction, if you embrace bitterness and hatred, if you have no qualms about telling lies and spreading rumors, then there is something severely wrong with your heart, severely wrong. If you're practicing sin with no real sense of conviction and you're calling yourself a Christian, you might need to do some soul searching. You might need to do some heart inspection. For to be a redeemed child of God does not compute with continually and habitually practicing unrepentant sin. I'm reading a book right now. It's over my head. Like the guy's some kind of British scholar, and he's quoting French philosophers all the time. Half the time, I'm like, I have no idea what he's talking to, but I'm committed to it. I'm, I'm going to finish it. And, but he said something really profound that really stuck with me. You know, sometimes, sometimes we embrace a practice or we embrace a lifestyle, and what we do is we blame something that is within us. Well, there's something that within me that I have to follow and I have to become that. And, and then we say something like, well, this is just the way I am. I inherited this. I was born this way. And so what we do is we choose to submit to something that is within us. And I'm not talking about unbelievers. Unbelievers can do whatever they want. It's not our place to judge the world. I'm talking to Christians here. Christians do this too. They... they they submit to something that is within them to, to lead them to live outside of God's will and they choose to give you know, the inklings and the attractions and the desires and the confusions more authority and more lordship in their life than the Lord. And this author of this book said, here's what he said, there's a difference between being born that way and being born for that way finally said something on my level. I'm like, oh my goodness. What a profound thought. There's a difference between being born that way and being born for 
that way because we're all born broken. Many of us have endured abuse or trauma that broke us even more. The world has made us this way. The generations that went before us made us this way. The things we endured, trials and hardships and trauma and abuse and suffering maybe, have made us this way. But as Christians, we are not made for this way. Oh, I'm broken. I have to live this way. I have to accept it. I have to find identity in it. No, you are not made for this way, Christian. That command isn't I'm jumping ahead of myself. Remember the command, do not take the Lord's name in vain? Remember that? And we think it's about cussing. It literally means do not bear the Lord's image in vain. Now remember, you're an image bearer of God. You are made in his image. And he doesn't want you to bear his image in vain. So the command isn't about cussing or using God's name as a cuss word. You shouldn't do that because it's disrespectful and common sense. But the command itself means to not bear God's image in vain. The unbelieving world, they're bearing the image of God, but they're bearing it in vain. They bear God's image, but they do it in vain. They don't know God. They don't honor God. They don't live lives that are according to his will. It's not our place to judge the world. But you, Christian, you are commanded to bear God's image with purpose. That's what you're called to. You're called to bear his image with purpose. That's what you're born for. Unless unless your name is Adam or Eve, and you're speaking historically from pre-Genesis chapter 3, you cannot say, God made me this way. Oh, God made me this way. No, God didn't make you this way. God made Adam and Eve that way. The rest of us, we're born broken. When we choose to live according to our broken identity, when we choose to follow our passion or our lust or our addiction or our pride or our selfish ambition, we're still bearing the image of God, but we're bearing it in vain. This is not what we're made for. We are not made for lawlessness. Continuing on, verse 7, little children... Let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he he has been born of God. By this it is evident Who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil? Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So John's making basically a black and white issue here, just like he did earlier. If you don't love your brother, you're in darkness. That was a black and white issue. He's doing it again. There's no gray here. If God is true to you, then you will walk in truth. Now, whenever this kind of thing comes up and the topic is laid out there on the table, And the scripture is making it clear. If you are a child of God, this is what you will do. If you don't do this, you're not a child of God. Whenever this comes up, inevitably, someone feels offense welling up within them. Oh, are you judging me? Are you saying I'm not a Christian because I live in lawlessness? I probably can say that. But don't blame me. Talk to this guy named John. You know, I think this is something we need to do every once in a while. We need to open up our Bibles. We need to find these black and white statements. And we need to throw them out there and we need to be challenged by them. And I want everyone to know, this is what I want. I, want, I don't want anyone just to be comfortable in mediocrity. I don't want anyone to doubt anything. I don't want anyone believing a lie about themselves. Here's what I want. I want everyone to know, at least in my community of faith, where I'm the pastor, I want everyone to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they are indeed redeemed believers in Jesus. I want everyone to confront their own lives with passages like this and resolve the conflict that is there. Is John calling your salvation into question? I sure hope so. We need challenges like this. The vast majority of us will hear this, we'll put our lives to the test 
will walk away challenged to avoid sin and lawlessness all the more. That's what most of us will do when we hear this, and that's good. That's what we should do. But maybe some here are, are feeling offense that, oh, are you calling my salvation into question because I live this way? John is, and God let him write the Bible. There's some authority in that. And well, if that's the case, you might want to ask yourself why that this offense is manifesting. Because here's what offense is. When we feel offended, and you know, we all feel offended in once in a while. We need to recognize it for what it is. Feeling offended, offense is evil. Because here's what offense is. Offense is a manifestation of pride. Oh, I'm offended by that. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe I said something wrong. I apologize for it. But the, the offense you're feeling is a recognition that you have an issue with pride. Offense is a manifestation of pride. And pride is a defense mechanism to bolster our broken ambitions. Jesus spoke of the tares amongst the wheat. Remember that? Oh, we got some weeds growing out here. Someone came and planted some weeds in our wheat field. Should we go tear them up? He said, no, no, no. Leave them there. We'll separate them at the harvest. But listen, I don't want tares in my community. I don't want weeds in my wheat field. I want everyone who is here to know beyond a shadow of a doubt who they are and what they believe. I want true, confident believers in Jesus. Passages like this help. Let me close by reading a couple of passages. And let me say this clear. They missed it first service. My band, you guys can come up now. If you're on the fence about what John is saying here, maybe these passages will clear them up. No commentary, just the verses. Romans 2.13, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. James 1.22, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, because if you only hear the word and don't do it, you're deceiving yourself. Romans 8, 16, verse 17, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. These passages don't require commentary. They speak for themselves. And so let me say this. If you're wrestling right now, if you're feeling pride, if you have some questions about things in your life that you're just allowing to be there, and you're like, maybe this is me practicing lawlessness. Well, God relishes the opportunity to hear your repentance and lead you to a place of change. God loves that. 